Are you ready to praise and worship the Lord? If you are, I would like to invite you to read with me Revelations chapter 19, and we will start from verse 1. After this, I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven, crying out, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for His judgments are true and just. For He has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of His servants. Once more, they cried out, Hallelujah! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who has seated on the throne, saying, Amen, Hallelujah. And from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, small and great. You know, there is this one word that is similar to all languages, and that is the word hallelujah. So if you are ready to praise and worship with me, come on, join me. Shout the praise and greatest glory to our God. Hallelujah!
this page is spare tonight There's no one else Just you and me When the curtains close behind There's no pretense I'm on my knees well with you, with your families and your loved ones. 
Um, before we pray for our tithes and love offerings, uh, may I invite you to open your Bibles at Luke chapter 6, verse 38. It says here, Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for your unfailing love. We are grateful for all you've done for us, for sustaining us, for blessing us. You have always been our provider. You have blessed us more than we can imagine. We now give you our tithes and love offerings with gladness. We pray that you bless them and use them to advance your kingdom. May you be glorified and be known to all the ends of the earth. Be magnified in our lives, O Lord. All glory and honor belongs to you alone. In the most precious name of Jesus, amen. Have a great day. God bless.
Good morning, Church. Welcome to our 8 o'clock worship service. I hope that all of you are doing well today, and we are glad that you are all with us wherever you are in the world, whatever time that you are in. Welcome to the 8 o'clock worship service. And today we'll be uh, having a passage of Scripture from the book of Ecclesiastes. But before we dive into the Word of God, can I just invite you to join me in a prayer? Let's pray. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise you, our Father. Lord, we thank you for who you are. Our amazing God, our Abba Father, whom we can trust, whom we can put our hopes upon, whom uh, we can rely always in our lives. Lord, you are the creator of the heavens and the earth. Everything, Lord God, that you have created praises in your glory. Praises you for your wonderful acts. Praises you for who you are. That you are righteous, holy, and sovereign. Lord, we just come before you right now, thanking you for always being with us, for guiding us, for allowing us, Lord, to experience your grace day after day in our lives. Thank you, Lord God, for sustaining us, helping us, Lord God, to walk faithfully despite our troubles, despite our difficulties in life. Lord, thank you for always helping us to go through life's trials. Thank you for your blessings, Lord. Thank you for your provisions, Lord. For the daily food that we eat, we thank you, Father. Even for the simple things, Lord God, that sometimes we forget. We thank you, Lord, because all good things come from you. Lord, thank you that your eyes are upon us, your people. That you watch over us, Lord. Thank you, Father. Lord, we just come before you right now, seeking, Lord God, upon your Holy Spirit that you would move in the hearts of your people, that you would move mightily, Lord God, and minister to each one of us, those who are listening, those who will be listening after this. Lord God, just move within your people, Lord God, and allow us to understand your message for us today. Lord, you know each one's heart. You know, Lord God, the condition of each person who is here. And Lord, we just pray that you would meet in the area of our needs, Lord. That for those who are sick, Lord God, may you give healing, Father. We know that you are a performer of miracles, Lord God. We believe that you still perform miracles even up to this time, Lord. Because you are able and you are our healer, our God, our Father. Lord, for those who are in need, Lord God, of finances, provide for their needs, Lord God. Lord, those who are weak and weary, tired, Lord God, we pray that you just embrace them, Lord God, and strengthen them, Lord God, that they may hold on unto you and draw strength upon you only. Father, you know each one of us, and we just commit each person who is here to you, Father. Lord, we are thankful because you are all-knowing. You are all-powerful, almighty, and all-present. Father, in our study, in our, in our diving deep into your word, Lord God, we ask, Lord God, that you enlighten us, give us your message. Allow us to understand your message. And in our midst, Father, be glorified. To you belong all glory always, all honor and all praise. In the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And everybody say, Amen and Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. So the book of Ecclesiastes, you know, it is a very good book. And it gives us, gives us a lot of things to realize. In fact, it gives us so much things to ponder on about life. And one thing that God has taught me in this book is to contemplate on my life. 
to think of how short my life is. And you know, we take the shortness of our lives for granted so much. We spend on so many things that are very secondary or even the things that without eternal purpose. You know, I saw several charts, charts from the U.S., of what an, Amer uh, uh, an average American spends most of their time with. And this is what I found out. You know, they spend 35 to 40 percent of their time. This is the, their whole lifetime, okay? They spend 35 to 40 percent going to sleep, uh, in sleeping or in resting. That's a huge, huge per percentage, no? And about 20% to 25% goes to work. 12% to 15% goes to spending their time on leisure, on activities. And 20 to 30% is distributed to so many other things, little things like eating, socializing, time spent with family, time spent with friends, exercise, and many more. You know, it's okay if we uh, take a time of leisure, a time to relax from time to time. It's okay if we have long hours of sleep sometimes just to regain strength. It's also okay if we work very hard, even spend over time in our work so that we can save for our future, for our children. But you know, if the majority of our time goes to these things that, that are being uh, mentioned in the chart already, and this happens in our whole lifetime, my question is, is that really what life is all about? Is this it? 40% of sleeping, 20 to 25% of working, the rest uh, on leisure and activities. You know, in this passage that we'll be reading today, the author, we, we don't know who the author really is. Some say it's Solomon. A lot of people say it's Solomon. But some also do not believe it is Solomon. But we're not going to talk about that. Let's talk about what the author is saying. The author tells us to contemplate on life. And in the reflection of death, this helps us ponder on the many aspects of our life. So the title of our sharing for today, uh, God's word for today is, The Living Should Take This to Heart. The living should take this to heart. And we'll be reading from Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verses 1 to 6. So if you have your Bibles, can you bring them up and let's read together. It says here, A good name is better than fine perfume, and the day of death better than the day of birth. It is better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting. For death is the destiny of everyone. The living should take this to heart. Frustration is better than laughter because a sad face is good for the heart. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of pleasure. It is better to heed the rebuke of a wise person than to listen to the song of fools. Like the crackling of thorns under the pot, so is the laughter of fools. This too is meaningless. You know, I've noticed the word better in these verses that we've, re re we've read. And it gives a contrast to something and something better than the other. And the contrasts are wise and fools, mourning and feasting or pleasure, frustration and laughter. You know, just to give you a summary of what we have read, it is all about life is short. 
and we should ponder on life more rather than living a carefree and foolish life with no regard for tomorrow. So for us to be guided on the message that we're going to discuss, I've broken it down into three parts, discussion points. And the first one is this. Life is short. Live it right. Life is short. Live it right. And this can be found in verses 1 to 2. Again, it says here, A good name is better than fine perfume, and the day of death better than day of birth. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to the house of feasting, for death is the destiny of everyone, and the living should take this to heart. You know, having a good name means living a life of righteousness. But there needs to be a source of that righteousness. We cannot live a righteous life without really having to uh, having a source of it. You know, as Christians, you and I understand that our righteousness is in Christ. That our source of what is right and what is wrong is in God. You know, a good name can only be manifested by what is within us. Or better yet, who is within us. The contrast to having a good name here is fine perfume. And it says, a good name, having a good name is better than fine perfume. And you know, it represents, the, the perfume, the fine perfume represents the physical aspect of life rather than the moral aspect of life. The perfume can attract people around us, right? And it can give you a bump up in society. Imagine if you're walking uh, in inside a mall and you're wearing this very expensive perfume and people who knows that scent uh, would think that you are well off, that you are a person who is rich, right? So you're automatically bumped up into the level of society. <laughs> and, you know, it can also gain a favor uh, with people if you smell good. But it can only last until the scent is there. Imagine if your scent is now bad, you're smelling bad. Automatically, your social status will become negative. They will think negatively of you. While a good name, in contrast to what the perfume is uh, all about, a good name or a good reputation comes from something that is within. It does not reflect something that you can just put on and off, but rather it is a reflection of your life itself, how it is lived and the consistency of it. Basically, it is who we are in Christ Jesus that is much more important than what we have. You know, a good proverb says this in chapter 22, verse 1. A good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver or gold. You know, we only get one chance to live our lives, right? There's no repeat. There's no uh, uh, retake or reset. And you cannot hit the restart button when it, things goes bad. And the author of this book has repeatedly said that life under the sun is meaningless. Life under the sun is meaningless. And you know, that is very true. If we do not know God, if we do not live for God. And so, we ought to live for God so that we would live lives that has true meaning. And you know what would help us with that? The author is saying to us that we need to contemplate on how short life is. 
How can a person say that death is something to be excited about? Can you answer that? How can you, when will you usually think that death is something to be excited about? You know, because the author is saying here, death is better than life, than birth. You know, we can only look forward to dying. You and I can only be excited to die when we truly know that Christ is in our lives. When we know that we have lived our lives for Christ. Amen? Do you agree with me? And in contrast to that, you know that people in the world are afraid to die? Some has probably just allowed themselves to be numb of death. But regardless, they are afraid to die. You know why? Because when they are in the point of death, they become very unsure of what's going to happen next. When death faces them, they don't know what's next. And when they think back to their lives, they have le lived a carefree life, a careless life. They have lived a foolish life, and that scares them. And so the author says, it is better to go to the house of mourning. You know why? So that people can contemplate on how short life really is. Every time there's death in the family, we try to realize the shortness of life. We try to understand the shortness of life. It was just then when I saw this person. It was just then. It was just a while ago when this person was with me. It was just a few uh, years back when we experienced this and that. And now this person is dead. And it dawns unto you. That life is short. And so, the author says, it's better to go to the house of mourning rather to, than going to the house of feasting. You know, in the house of feasting, they get drunk on the pleasures of life with no regard to what's going to happen for tomorrow. And you know what? The bad thing is, they will only suffer the consequences. So remember, life is short. Think about it. The living should take this to heart. Life is short. We need to live it right. We need to live it knowing who God is. Having Christ in our lives. The second point is, Life is short, so we need to search for what is right. Life is short, search for what is right. And this can be found in verses 3 to 4. And it says here, Frustration is better than laughter, because a sad face is good for the heart. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of pleasure. Again, the author draws us to think, to contemplate. Why do I say that? Because of the word heart. And it is mentioned here in these two verses three times. And it can also be translated, the word heart can also be translated to mind or labe in Greek, which means the understanding of man, the thoughts of man. So verse 3 can be translated as this, Frustration is better than laughter because a sad face is good for our understanding. Now why is that? Why is frustration, difficulty, and trials good for our understanding? You know why? Because 
It is in these times, in times of difficulty in our life, in times of frustration, in times of trial, that our faith can be developed. In these times, if we apply our minds to think, to contemplate on God's ways, on God's character, on God's sovereignty, if in these times, rather than asking, Lord, how did this happen? Lord, why did this happen? Lord, why did this happen to me? We should rather say to God, Lord, in this difficult time, teach me. In this trying time, strengthen me. In this frustrating time, guide me. Work through me, Lord that I may understand who you are. And you know what? We will surely get the most of our life experience. The best thing in our life. We will get the most of it when we do it this way. We contemplate on the situation with God. Our trust in our faith in God will be developed. And the writer says here in verse 4, The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning. Yes, because the wise would use these times of sorrow to understand more about life. More so, us Christians, you and I, the followers of Christ will use these moments, I believe, we will use these moments by God's grace to contemplate on our frustrations in the presence of God, with the Word of God, and with the guidance of God. You know, according to the writer, those who are foolish will do their best to drown their sorrows in the house of pleasures. Don't you notice that in, in the people of this world today? They will try to solve their problems with momentary pleasures. They will uh, go into drunkenness. They will busy themselves with several activities, busy themselves with so many things just to forget their problems their frustrations, just to feel that loneliness, that emptiness in their hearts. But you know, nothing can really be achieved and learned in doing that. They will just end up finding themselves back in the mud when reality kicks back in. Right? And that is why, that is why the world really needs Jesus Christ. For life will just be a meaningless cycle of sorrow and frustrations without Christ in our lives. Do you agree with me? Amen. So, be wise. Since life is short, in the midst of our trials, our frustrations, search for what is right. Search for the Lord's leading. Seek for His guidance and wait for His answer. You know, if you are in deep trial now, I don't know who you are. I don't know if some of you are really in a bad situation right now. If you are in that situation, if you are that person, take heart. This is a very good time to put your heart, your mind into understanding God through His Word and see how His grace would help you to walk faithfully in the midst of difficulty day after day after day. He will sustain you and you will see the beauty of frustrations. You will see the beauty of trials. You will see the beauty of difficulty. It will increase your faith upon God. It will develop your faith on God. 
Amen? Praise God. And the third one, and we will be ending with this. Life is short, so do what is right. Life is short, do what is right. The verse says, It is better to heed the rebuke of a wise person than to listen to the song of fools. Like the crackling of thorns under the pot, so is the laughter of fools. This too is meaningless. You know, many times we think that we are doing well. We think that we are on the right track. Yes, many times it is true. But there are times that we too are acting foolishly. We just don't know that we are doing it. Right? We always try to correct the foolish ways of others, but we never try to stop and think, am I also being foolish? Lord, am I also acting foolishly? Am I also thinking foolishly? And you know, sadly, we even listen to foolish talk. We listen to bad-mouthing. Many times we even add up to it. Sadly, this also happens everywhere. We listen to bad counsel. We listen to worldly advice. It happens in even inside a Christian community. And what the writer is saying here is very important. He says, heed the rebuke of a wise person. You know, it is in fact for me, as I have understood it, when someone is rebuking you, it is a blessing. It is a blessing because sometimes we do not see that we are foolish. We do not see that we have committed something wrong. And only a person outside, apart from you, can see it. And so if we receive that rebuke, someone rebukes you, if that instance comes, again, think. Contemplate. Try to understand what is happening. What is inside your heart. Don't start to defend. Don't start to retaliate. Don't start to work your way around it. Let us check our own ways. Be wise. And take to heart the rebuke given to us. You know, most if not all the time, it is God's word of truth that really rebukes us. When the Word of God penetrates deep into our beings and we are convicted by it. You know, let us learn to receive that. Let us learn to receive the rebuke or the conviction of God's Word and choose to do what is right. Amen? So we have learned three points from God's Word today. Life is short. And we need to take it to heart. So, because life is short, let's live it right. Let's live knowing who God is. Let's spend time knowing what God wants us to do. To do. Let's read His Word and get to know the grace and, and mercy of God through Jesus Christ. Because life is short, the second part, let's seek for what is right. In those times of frustration, in those times of difficulty, when you cannot think right, when you cannot act right, stop, pause for a while. Linger in your thoughts. Contemplate on what's happening. And do it with God. Don't Go out and um, drown yourself in many activities. Pause. And ask the Lord to help you. Ask the Lord to guide you. Ask the Lord to lead you to do what is right. Wait upon the Lord. Because life is short, the third point is do what is right. 
If someone rebukes you, receive it. Think about it. Allow that moment to change your life. If the Word of God rebukes you or, or convicts you, allow it to sink in deep into your heart and apply your life to what is right. Do what is right. You know, I'd like to leave you this quote from Pastor John Piper. And he says, But whatever you do, find the God-centered, Christ-exalting, Bible-saturated passion of your life and find your way to say it and live for it and die for it. And you will make a difference that lasts. Your life will not you will not waste your life hallelujah let's pray praise you our god our king lord thank you for your word today thank you for reminding us lord god how short our lives are and we should contemplate about our ways our life our actions, our thoughts, what would be our next move. And in this thinking, Lord God, in this deep thinking of our lives, Lord God, may you reveal to us by your word on what to do. May you, Lord God, move in the hearts of your people so that we may follow you, that we may come to understand your glory your goodness, your grace, your mercy upon each one of us, and that we would live appropriate lives, life that is pleasing to your eyes. Teach us, Lord God, to count our days. Teach us, Father, to number our days, that we may be wise in living it. Lord, thank you for this message. And Lord, as we part ways, be with your people. As you have given us your message, Lord, strengthen us as well, Lord God, to do your will. Help us, Lord God, to share your message to those who need it most. May your Holy Spirit be with us, guide us, anoint us, Father, to do your will. We thank you, Father, and we give you all glory, honor, and praise in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And everybody say, Amen and Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you for joining us in this 8 o'clock worship service, and God bless you all.